Well, hello everyone. It's uh, Brad and Cheryl. We're back again for our third LinkedIn Live and we're excited to be here for today's version of AI is not replacing humans and here's why. And uh, we look forward to your comments and any insights that you have uh, during the session. And uh, I'll reintroduce myself and then let Brad introduce himself. I'm Cheryl Cran. I am the founder of Next Mapping, a future of work consultant agency. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Super Crucial Leader Retreat with Brad, and I've written 10 books. The last one's called Super Crucial Human and have worked with leaders in a variety of industries over the past two decades, helping them to develop their leadership skills, helping them to be more agile, to be uh, future ready change leaders. And so, Brad, tell everybody who you are for this one, and then we'll get right into the content. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Brad Brenninger. I am currently the EVP of strategy at Believe Co, uh, marketing and consulting uh, agency, um, as well as uh, lead our AI um, lab uh, at Believe Co as well. And have worked for years in the brand, communication, marketing, um, facilitation area, uh, working with a lot of leaders throughout the career. I also lead a current team at Believe Co on the strategy side. And uh, so um, totally understand all of the issues around leadership and AI and all the things that you're dealing with. Yeah, wonderful. So let's get right into it here um, and, and talk about why AI is not replacing humans. And before we get into the slides, Brad, let's just start with a little bit of, uh, you know, pre 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 talk here from your perspective. Um, I, I've done a lot of research on this. And I know you have in your role. Mm -hmm. And the yes, the, what, what we found, the research is saying that tasks will be automated. There's no question. It's right. already happening. Yes. Yeah. And robots will be part of every every workplace. That also is true. However, what they're not being able to justify or even validate yet is will that replace human bodies? Our research says it's not going to replace human bodies. It's going to change the nature of work. It's going to change it from repetitive, mundane to having to be more elevated, more strategic, uh, more uh, ha more people having leadership skills in order to succeed. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree completely, Cheryl. I think that there's there are a lot of tasks and there are a lot of um, things that machines can do better um, than humans, faster than humans, um, access to more data points, all of those kinds of things. Um, but, but one of the words that we'll talk about a little bit later is the word contextualization. One of the issues around AI and, and what AI brings to the table is that a lot of times, and, and you see this often if you're using ChatGPT or any of the other tools that we'll talk about, um, but you see that it might not have the exact way that a human would do it now, right. or, or that a human would say it, or maybe the information is not exactly the way you might um, do the phraseology. And that's where contextualization comes in and the ability to kind of go back and look at it and, and see what works and how you can adjust it. Now, over time, the machines will iterate and they will learn and, and they will get better at that because they're, you know, accessing millions and millions of data points um, in a, a fraction of a second. But that being said, there are still some other elements to the human experience that a machine can't replicate at least not for now. I don't think we fully yes. know what is yeah. possible, but if we kind of take where we're at today, there's still a lot of elements around machines and, and NLP and machine learning, um, NLP being neuro linguistic programming um, and the ability for a machine to learn uh, over time, different ways of saying things or, or ways to contextualize. There are still some limitations around that. And, and, and so it will take a while for that to happen. Absolutely. Yes. So let's get into, oops, wrong slide. Hang on, hang on. Nope. Oh, yeah, there we go. Ah, there we go. <laughs> um, so the current reality of AI is we're already using it. Uh, you know, so yeah. in, in next mapping, when I do um, audience polling and such, I asked the, an audience that I worked with a few weeks ago, how many of them were using AI? How many of them had never used it? And about 30% said they were using chat GPT primarily for writing, editing, ideation, uh, a variety of things. And then about another 30% said they were using it sporadically. They would use it, forget about it, and then realize that, yes, they could use it. And yeah. then the remainder, which was about like the, the 40% said never used it, never tried it. Now, I thought that was fascinating because a yeah. lot of people still are afraid. Yeah, Brad, go ahead. 
Well, I, I just think that people aren't really sure of all the things that are available to them or how to access it or how to right. integrate it into the things that they do uh, on a daily basis. You know, I think that that's changing pretty quickly. I think people are becoming a lot more savvy. Um, but but the truth is, is that we've been using AI in a whole bunch of different areas for years and years. Just speaking to my own experience, um, in our media team, you know, when it comes to media optimization, there's been AI tools and machine tools for a long time that allow yes. you know the optimization of media and a whole bunch of different other things. So, AI has been prevalent for quite a while. Um, it's it's really more as it comes to the forefront and becomes more um, of a, you know, um, available to the general public that that. It, it's there's more discussion around it. There's more, in some cases, fear around it. Um, and, and so people just need to, you know, the early adopters, as, as Malcolm Gladwell talks about, you know, the yeah. early adopters and then and then it becoming, um, you know, part of society. The early adopters have been using it for a while. But, you know, generally in society, we're really getting the chance now to, to look at all of these different tools that are being developed. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, and we always date ourselves when we say these things, but it reminds me of when, like, I, I, I was one of the first websites that, you know, when every early adopter of when the, yeah. the World Wide Web, right? So 1996 right. <laughs> with my website. And it was literally a brochure on, yeah. on, a, on a website. That was all I mean, it was. Sure, right? yeah. but, but it didn't take long for the progression, for the exponential speed of everybody catching on and using it. And I use that comparison for the, the current reality is that's where we are right now. We're right yeah. on the edge of everyone and it becoming ubiquitous and everybody using it and and you know and, and being able to like we're already using it with Siri for example Siri is AI uh, Alexa is AI Google is AI so we're already interfacing with AI it's just contextualizing it which you'll talk about as we as we get there yes so yeah. let's keep going here um, as I said, we've already been using AI. So, so one of the questions for those watching or listening or who will watch the recording is, you know, where do you sit? If I were to do a polling question right now, if Brad and I were to poll you, would you be someone who, yep, you're already using it. You're an early adapter, early adopter. Are you somebody who's like, yeah, I'm still not sure. Um, or are you working in an organization where, and I have clients in this uh, reality where they're not allowed to use it at work yet because of security and fears around that and accuracy and all of those things. But interesting point here uh, is that I was speaking for a university group uh, a month or so ago, and it was um, the educators, the professors came up to me and said, yeah, we are letting them use AI because you can't not, not let them use it. But what they're doing is they're asking them to cite that, that what they've used as the AI support tool. Right. And then they've also, so they put parameters around usage so that they can identify what's accurate or not accurate from, from a school standpoint. Mm -hmm. In the workplace, nothing prohibits a leader from using it for their own daily activities um, you know, as a leader, like, for example, you might ask, well, what's the best way to talk to this employee right now about X? And it will give you guidance on that. Mm -hmm. um, but organizations embedding AI into an organization were on the, the tipping point of that as well. And what would you say to that, Brad? Yeah. yeah, I completely agree, Cheryl. I think that, you know, one of the things that organizations are struggling with is, is what is the policy around AI? How right. do I you know, because I think that everyone knows that people are using it um, and that's fine. But there are there are some issues, even when it comes to copyright and, yes. you know, the machines going in and taking information or learning from information that has copyright attached to it. So there are there are legal implications. There are security implications, as you said. I think that what a lot of organizations are doing right now is they're putting policies in place of, of when to use it, when not to use it. One of the things that we're doing is we're mm -hmm. saying, you know what, our policy is that you can use it, but you can't use the product to go directly to clients. There has to be right. human interaction. There has to be human thought around what comes back. And, and also, you know, checking out the, the, the sources and, and, and making sure that we're not taking information that belongs to someone else and, and, you know, selling it as our own. So, so I do think that there are some parameters that a lot of organizations are putting in place. That said, 
as leaders, you know, it's important for us to understand what those parameters are. It's important for us to understand what the limitations are and what the risks are, but to also be able to encourage our teams to use it to be more creative or to yeah. be more um, informed or to do the research that will either inspire them or motivate them to then add their piece to it. So I still think that there are a lot of opportunities within the AI context that leaders can, you know, um, put in their tool chest. Yeah, agreed completely. Yep. Um, one thing I want to point out before we continue going here as well is uh, Brad and I are, are co-leading the Super Crucial Leader Retreat May 7 to 9 in Vancouver. And these LinkedIn Lives that we've been doing are just sort of, um, as Brad would say, an amuse bouche. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. for the the value and the content and the discussions we'll be having at the retreats around all of these items. So yeah. AI is part of that curriculum uh, specific to how can you leverage it as a leader? We won't be getting into the organizational piece because, of course, uh, there'll be leaders from a variety of different industries there with different levels of um, you know authority in that regard. But as how can you use it as a leader? And we'll get into that in, in this uh uh, LinkedIn Live in a moment here too. Uh, uh, Gallup has said 88% of workers believe AI will improve their work in life. So while there may be fear, there's optimism. Uh, they do believe it's going to be helpful. They do believe that it's it's speeding things up. Uh, I know for myself, it's made a huge difference in my Let's just look at, and this is just a real partial list. I'm sure that those of you watching probably have as much insight or more than we have, Brad, to be honest, because there are a lot of people who are on the leading edge of AI. Uh, but here's what AI can do. It can parse data. It helps you ideate, helps you write, helps you create photos, create videos, uh, dream analysis, which by the way, I threw that in there because a very good friend of mine, I told her about this weird and wacky dream. She's like, throw that in chat GPT and ask it to analyze it in the voice of Jung and Freud. And so I did, and it was fascinating. It was like, oh my gosh, it was like having my own little dream interpreter in my pocket. So that's a that's a quick one for everybody. Uh, yeah. It helps us interpret languages or context. It helps us uh, sort data very quickly. And what else, Brad, what would you say, what else it's done for, for you and for your group and, and for you personally? Yeah, there. I mean, there's there's so many things, Cheryl, and I think new things are happening every day. You know, you can you can analyze um, data with all of the um, points that you want to, um, you know, put forward. You can have it do plans for you. You can have it do, um, you know, messaging for you. For yeah. and, you know, here throw in your audiences and and you know what are the key messages that you would give to each of these audiences based on these problems. So there's a lot of um, scenarios and a lot of things that are really um, powerful that it can do. Where, where the human aspect comes into it is that, you know, the more that you can be informed and the more that you can use the tools um, from a place of knowledge, the better you are at leveraging the power of those tools. And one of the things that I always say is that when it comes, you know, using whether it's, you know, mid journey for, for photography yep. or whether it's, you know, chat GPT for, for um, writing or content, you know, becoming a really strong prompt engineer and, and creating a prompt engineering mindset within your team also becomes really strong. And it, uh -huh. at the retreat, we'll talk a lot more about what prompt engineering means and how you can get better at it um, and, and, you know, all of those elements to it. But really what it boils down to is understanding how to use the tools and, and understanding their limitations, understanding their power and, and being as specific as you possibly can, um, you know, and, and really making sure that you cover all the different scenarios and, and putting in multiple scenarios. The one thing I always say is, if you're asking these tools to do something for you, come up with multiple different scenarios, have the machine kind of approach it from each of those different perspectives, and then take that as a human being and look at it and see, okay, which of these actually feels the most human or feels like the most of what a human brain could do or, mm -hmm. or is capable of, where it mixes, you know, analytics, where it mixes creativity, where it mixes empathy and all of these different things to come up with a solution. And, you know, what I found is that when you kind of approach it from that perspective, it gives you this much broader um, opportunity. And then, you know, you as the human can go in and, and choose the direction that's best. 
Mm -hmm. One thing I would say about our retreat that's really unique is that we're looking at AI as a tool to encompass everything else that you're trying to get better at. Yeah. So it's, it's in the context. So to your point about context, Brad, it's in the context of how do we be a better leader? How do we leverage AI for that? So we'll we'll talk more about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's keep going. I will say personally for me as a consultant, owning my own consulting firm, I do use ChatGPT for ideation for my blog posts, my articles, even for social media posting. So I'll go in and I'll say, this is what I have in my mind. I'll ask it to write in the voice of Cheryl Cran because mm -hmm. now that AI is caught up, it's, it's real time. Um, it's able to know and parse the internet and find it. So the more presence you have, the more it knows your voice. So I'll literally say, write an article in the voice of Cheryl Cran on XYZ. It does it. It's my job as human to go through it because a lot of times it, it's too poetic or it's too flowery or it doesn't sound right. like me or yeah. it sounds like a machine. So I just use that as a starting point, but it saves me hours, Brad, like hours right. of work that I used to have to do before. So Agreed, Cheryl. And, and often, if you really think about it, if you look at how artists work or how writers work, a lot of times it's an initial information dump or a stream of exactly. consciousness that goes first, yeah. right? And then from there, you you refine and you adjust and, and you do all of those things. And the yeah. neat thing about working with AI and that AI human interaction is that you can really use the AI tools to be that stream of consciousness to, to, to kind of get that first pass. And, you know, I, I often say to my team, it, it, ChatGPT really alleviates that blank page syndrome that a lot of us yes, have, where it's kind of like, mm, where do I even begin? Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, it, and it, it, it jumps in and, and provides that initial, I guess, motivation and, and that, that first draft that is often the, the, much easier way to work from. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of times I'd have writer's block. You know, you yeah. just sit there yeah. and I'd be like, I know what I want to say, but I don't even know where to start. Well, That's with ChatGPT, I can put what I want to say and it lets me start. So that alone saves saves major time. So yeah, it's 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 amazing. So the future is human <laughs> with AI assistance. And right. um, really that is what what AI is. It's our assistant. It's not replacing us. It can't. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> yet. Everybody does say that. Okay. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. go with yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we can look at those utopian or those, those, uh, dystopian, you know, yeah, dystopian yeah. examples of movies <laughs> where it's like, ah, oh, this is where we're going. But then yeah. that's, I believe that's what creates more fear. Right. It so, does. so really from my perspective, you know, human first, Brad, you're a leader that's very human focused. Um, you know, if, if we're using it for the good, like, and I, and I tend to tend to be a pragmatic optimist, mm -hmm. if we're really focused on making the world a better place or being a better leader, and we're using it for that, then I see that it's positive. Yeah. So, so when we talk about the future is human, it's really about what is it that AI can't do? Well, it can't do those distinctly human things. It can't emote. And Brad might say yet, but let's just say it can't emote. No, I, I don't even know if then, like yeah. even in those dystopian tales, they're not it, really emotional. No, they're not. No. <laughs> yeah. That one Meg one with a young girl. I don't know if you ever saw that one, but that was creepy. It yeah. was this little robot girl and she could emote and she learned at the speed of change. But let's not go there. That will create fear. Agree, agree, agree. <laughs> um, it, it can't censor into it. And that's, you know, so when we talk about future ready skills, you know, and we talked about this on previous previous LinkedIn lives, the skills to be a leader now really are leaning on that emotional intelligence, that EQ, that sensing, that noting, that 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 mirroring, that that uh, energetic intelligence. There's there's just these elevation of human skills that that I believe AI is causing us to have to have, and I think that's a very positive thing. Yeah. It, uh, EQ, as I said, and love. So in my book, um, Super Crucial Human, I talk about this. I, I talk about love. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about it in previous LinkedIn lives where it's it's not about love in the way that we normally contextualize it. It's love for humans, love for the work we do, love for making change, love for progress. That's that's they can't do that. We can. And together, though, if if, if AI is helping us speed up the ideation and mm -hmm. speed up the 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 mundane, I believe it helps us all to be better humans. Brad, what would you say about that part? What else do you think is human that that these AIs can't do? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest ones, and I, I talk to my team about this a lot, is it 
they can't sense a vibe. Like when you're, you know, we, we talk about energy a lot and, and, you know, really what energy kind of boils down to is the vibe. Like sometimes you can be speaking, you know, very analytically to someone and you immediately see that there's an emotional reaction and then you have to shift into emotional mm -hmm. capability because you have to ride the energy and you have to ride the vibe a little bit and, and kind of get them through that piece of it. And then maybe you can go back to the analytical piece, mm -hmm. you know, being able to walk that line between analytical and emotional is still a very human characteristic. Um, we might not be able to be as analytical as quickly or as, as with many, as with as many data points, but we are able to walk that wave in a much uh, stronger way than any machine can, except maybe in works of fiction, but, um, but right. it exists right yeah. now. And so, so I would add that to the list too, Cheryl. I mean, I think all the things you said are, are important, but you know, that ability to sense things, that ability to sense and react or sense and, and adjust is, yeah. is such an important part of it too. Yeah. Agreed with you completely. And I think again, when we, when, you know, if you're a highly analytical person, and you've always relied on task to, to help you feel like you're achieving something, then yes, this is going to be a challenging time because we're being asked to be more emotional. We're being asked to be more in touch. We're being asked to sense vibes. So those skills, and I detest the term soft skills. I refuse. No, soft skills implies they're not important. These are essential human skills that we are talking about here. <laughs> yes. Please. Yeah, couldn't agree more. All right. Now, this is a very teeny tiny slide. <laughs> Don't expect everyone to be able to see it. However, you will be able to see uh, when you play it back. But but basically, Mike Quindanzi, who's another uh, excellent future of work uh, researcher, he has done some research, and this is actually not his research, he's sharing it, on the number of jobs that are going to be created as a result of AI. So these jobs are being created because we still need, and by the way, let me point out that there's still a shortage of workers and there's predicted to be until at least the year 2030. Yeah. So it's, it's actually not taking jobs at this point. Might it in the future? It possibly, but again, it'll be making our lives and our quality of lives a better thing. So uh, these jobs, a lot of them manufacturing, a lot of them are in uh, you know, labor examples, although robots are now doing farming activities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if uh, you know, you're, you're familiar, Brad, or you've heard about the care bots in Japan, uh, where these wow. robots are they're, they're, They take care of aging and, and ill oh, people. Wow. Wow. So yeah, where one of the biggest risks for healthcare workers is lifting human bodies. Mm -hmm. Robots are now doing this. And what's right. fascinating is the human who's being lifted is anthropomorphizing the robot, but of course, because it's holding them and securing them. Yeah. And then they did a post survey, and this has been going on in Japan and Asia for quite, but, but they've been way ahead of this. So I'd say at least 10 years, because I've been talking about it for that long. Yeah. They did surveys of the patients lifted and they felt more secure being held by a robot than they did by, by, by a human or, or two humans. So that's just one example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 Fascinating, Cheryl, you know, something that you brought up, which is the jobs that will be created from this, like if you think about it, if you go back in time to the, you know, 1920s or the 1930s, you know, and you said, yeah, in the future, there's going to be a job called marketing coordinator, people would have just said to you, what even is that? So, right. so this idea, like, I mean, I think we really have to put ourselves in both a historical present day and future mindset. Like it's, it's really about the fact yes. that we don't necessarily understand what jobs will be created. The reason that AI won't replace humans is because humans are here to stay. Um, now it, it may, it may and will replace some of our more, um, you know, labor intensive or, yep. um, you know, uh, less, thinking jobs that are just the same over and over and over again to a lot of humans, that's a welcome thing. Um, and, yes. you know, maybe it will allow humans to evolve a little bit differently or to think a little bit differently or to look for opportunities outside of some of those very traditional jobs. But the truth is, is that in 1920, they might not have known what a marketing coordinator would be. And now in, you know, 2024, we don't necessarily know what the job title is going to be, you know, 80 years from now. So Absolutely. I do think, you know, that's something that we have to keep in mind in order to wrap our heads around this idea of jobs and, 
in future. Right. And when I share some of the resources that we have, and, and uh, or we're going to let people look, check out, you know, AI resources. One of the things that uh, I subscribe to Ben's Bytes, for example, that's one of them. And there are uh, at least hundred jobs daily posted in the yeah. AI world. So yeah. just like uh, prompt engineers is a job. Prompt engineer yeah. is a job, you know. So, yeah. so these are these are um, you know maybe AI can eventually do the prompt engineering, but for now it's it's right. a job, right? Yeah, and, and it will evolve. Like it, it will, will evolve. evolve. So jobs yeah. will evolve. The the role that we play will evolve. Yeah. Um, so the key there AI. is being able to change, being yeah. able to pivot, being right. resilient to what is going to happen in the future. We right. we don't know. So therefore, what do we have control over? Building our skills, Correct. getting better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. So what can you do today um, is you can leverage AI. Yeah. You can use the best tools and educational resources. I mentioned Ben's Bytes. It is a, uh, a newsletter that I subscribe to. Brad, Brad knows about it as well. Yeah. Um, it, it's excellent resource. It, it basically aggregates all of the AI innovations and sends it to your inbox every day. And I read it daily so that I can be on top of what's happening. What are the latest innovations? Uh, Mid Journey, Brad, you mentioned it. Uh, photo creation. And in fact, I was reading a magazine uh, on my iPad the other day, and they credited the photos of being created by Mid Journey, and they actually published the prompt. So yeah. I took a screenshot of the prompt because I'm like, this is awesome. Like they're doing this in in in, in magazines and such, right, Brad? So I thought that was yeah. cool. Yeah. 100%. And, and yeah. you know, Mid Journey is probably one of the most famous, but there are a ton yes. of both photography and videography tools that are out there, um, you know, going back to this idea of the educational resources, um, look for AI folks to follow, look for AI resources like Ben's Bytes, and there are others out there as well, and see, like, for us to list all the tools that are available would be impossible. Yeah, exactly. like, yeah, new ones are coming online every single day. So, yeah. you know, it, it's really important here as you're leveraging AI or thinking about leveraging AI, go with the big ones like Mid Journey and ChatGPT, but also these educational resources that are going to give you windows into these tools that are coming or tools that others are trying out so that you can kind of, you know, give them a try after someone else has done all the legwork, so to speak. And and we're even getting into a review process where people are reviewing how how good these tools are. So, so stay in tune with that as you're leveraging. Yeah. And I'd like to give a shout out to us, Brad, because we've created three AI tools that we would share at the retreat mm -hmm. uh, for leadership specific AI tools around uh, common leadership challenges. So that's something that's a bonus of, of part of the retreat package. Uh, product Hunt is another email uh, service that it does the latest AI products and innovations. Mm -hmm. uh, consensus, what I love about consensus, consensus, and I use it is it's AI, but it's rather than just AI asking it for a web-based, it's actually research papers and academic papers. So it's more of a validated uh, AI search with consensus. And then guide uh, a lot of organizations and a lot of leaders that I work with. One of the biggest challenges right now is knowledge transfer. And guide is a AI overlay tool that you put on your videos or your training manuals in your organization. And it helps, you can search it through by using AI. So gone are the days of going through a leadership manual or you know, even, even searching a PDF. Because this is AI uh, created, it finds the most relevant information so that people can learn at the speed of change, Brad. So these are just yeah. a few, as you said. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the retreat, we'll have a much longer list and we'll go through them in a more, in more detail and share with you some of the, you know, experiences that we've had with them. Um, but we want to give you a flavor and a taste for the kinds of things that, um, that we want to bring to the retreat. Yeah. Fantastic. So this is where Brad, I'm going to, I'm going to let you do most of the talking here about context because you're working yeah. on this with your team a lot. Um, yeah. The only thing I'll say about context before we get started is um as leaders, and, and I feel like as long as you are someone who can actually contextualize as a human being right now, you will be guaranteed lifelong work because the ability to make complex information simple, yeah. and to contextualize and help people on your teams or your boss or your leader or the CEO or you are the CEO, the more you can help people understand it from a variety of lenses. Mm -hmm the more we are going to validate our human value that we're adding here. 
And that's so that's so important, Cheryl. And that's what humans want is that, yeah. you know, we are inundated with data at this point in time. And, and you know, psychologically, um, a lot of psychologists, doctors, psychiatrists are saying that a lot of us are feeling overwhelmed and we're feeling very much unable to process all the things that are going on around us, whether it's social media or news or whatever, whatever the sources may be. And one of the hardest parts is that that's just going to get easier and easier for um, technology to do, which yes. is to give us more and more information. And that's because, you know, scouring millions of sources quickly is tech. That is tech's ability. That is tech's capability. But adding perspective, is what makes it human, right? Understanding what is important and what matters and and you know where it comes from and what the background is. That that's the human part that the machines are not there yet on. Um, and and in some cases may not get there as quickly right. as, as, as some may hope or think. Um, but that perspective is still almost uniquely human. Um, machine learning is tech. It can learn quickly. It can go after sources. It can, you know, find different examples. Like we often as humans will look at case studies or best practices is the term that we use a lot in order to determine what is our best course of action or what's the best way for us to move forward. And the truth is a machine can do that way faster and access things much easier than we can mm -hmm. and, and put together you know, scenarios based on everything that's been done in the past. But what they don't do as well is understand why it was done that way. Like, again, a lot of times they'll look at the data points or they'll look at, you know, well, he here's how it was done 40 times, but maybe 30 of those times was an adequate result and 10 of them really knocked it out of the park. Mm -hmm. And there's not necessarily information always in the data as to how it got knocked out of the park, because that understanding is a very human trait. It's tied to creativity. It's tied to empathy. It's tied to a whole bunch of different things as to why something was hugely successful um, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, moderately successful. And it's also the reason, a great example of this, and I use this example all the time. Right now, even a machine cannot predict a viral video. It can't. It can mm -hmm. it can give you all the data points. It can say this is, you know, these are all the elements that made, you know, this video hit five million views. But you may do all of those things and your video may get a thousand views. Like that's just not something that a machine can predict. And so, you know, the answer to the humanistic part is is you know, and what makes things viral, often the things that make it viral are the human things, like the understanding, like the empathy, like the shared experience, or like the, oh my God, I, that just happened to me three weeks ago, whatever it might be. Um, so that's a, a really strong indicator of, of the difference between tech and human. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, data is tech. We have so much data available to us now. We have so many things. We can, we can take the data and we can look at it a whole bunch of different ways, but aligning it to purpose is very, very human. Being mm -hmm. able to move the data around. And, and it's interesting because I talked earlier about this idea of vibe right? A lot of times vibe is not just being able to walk that wave between analytical and, and emotional, but it's also the ability to look at data and say, you know what, that just doesn't sit right with me. I understand that that's why it looks the way it does, but there's got to be something deeper here. And asking for other data points or other data sources that perhaps a machine might not think of because they're looking for the strongest, quickest solution to something, as opposed to a human, which will, you know, take that vibe, take that, mm, the smell test that we often call it and say, I need more information here. I need to look deeper here. Um, and you see this in, you know, medical prediction is a really good example of this. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, you can look at symptoms or you can look at all of the things that a patient might be going through and you can align to a diagnosis. And, and in a lot of cases, the diagnosis is, is correct, but there may be 
differing factors, or there may be other factors or outside influences. And, and even if you want to go deeper, if you want to get into causality and all of those other kinds of things, you know, that human brain is still able to use all the tools within it to accomplish some of the things that the machine can't do. And, you know, it really comes back to this idea of assistance, as you said earlier, Cheryl, that between the AI and the tech and the human, there's this assistant capability, right? It's there to assist us because the bottom line is that without contextualization, information is useless. We have all the information we could ever want. There's probably more information that exists in the world right now within the last 10 years than ever existed in human history. Has it made us better? Has it stopped wars? Has it, you know, no, it hasn't done any of that. There's going to be an eclipse in like probably (laughs) 30 minutes, right? right? 30 (laughs) minutes if you're in the path. Um, You know what? We we don't rule the sun. We don't rule the moon. (laughs) Like we we just don't, right? So things happen outside of our control. But the machines don't have connection to all of those things. They don't have that connection to the energy humans do. And so that combination between the two just becomes really powerful and allows us to contextualize. Yeah. And you just set up our last LinkedIn live, which will be next Monday really well, because that's all about exactly what you just said, Brad, which is the the, the amount of information and the stress that it's causing. Yeah. And, and really we are in a new era of it's no longer really about time management or even balance. I, I don't know that there is such a thing as balance. Yeah. It's really more around energy intelligence. How are we leveraging energy? And We'll talk about that on Monday, April 15th, as our fourth and last LinkedIn Live uh, for this uh, this series. Uh, the next piece is product ties. So, Brad, I'll hand right. that over to you as well and to speak yeah, thanks, to that. Girl. Yeah. So, yeah, productization is really how are you taking, you know, technology and AI and using it to innovate in the best possible way? So, as a leader, the questions you need to ask yourself is, what are you, what are you driving what are you using to drive your team to innovate? How are you getting them to think about, you know, your business or, or how you show up in a different way? Um, what current processes do you do that could be tech enabled? And this isn't just about creating software products. This is about using the tools that are currently out there as well and, and aligning them. And then finally, what tool combinations could refine your offer? So anything that you offer to, you know, your clients or your patients or, or, you know, your customers, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever communities you're serving or whatever, um, you know, groups you're serving, audiences you're serving, how can you use tech to offer it in a different way and enable your team to do that in the best possible way? So what do you need to consider as you're you're thinking about all of that? Don't leave AI out of the discussion. Always be thinking about, even if you can't afford or don't have the appetite to create you know, tech tools from scratch, you don't need to. A lot of times you can look at some of the existing tools and create combinations or permutations or even, you know, motivational elements that inspire your team on a much broader perspective. Um, And really get to that by evaluating your differentiators. How do you offer something different than your competitors or the others who are in your space? And how do you enable your team to figure out what those differentiators are and then figure out how to tech enable how you deliver on those. So that becomes a really strong, powerful way to do it. Um, Stay away from common, uh, common problems that are already solved. Like I said earlier, things are moving at 7,000 miles an hour. So there is a lot of, you know, low hanging fruit that's already being solved for. So ask yourself some of those deeper questions around how you can, you know, serve your audiences better in in a way that's unique to you. And especially if you offer a unique service or if you offer a common service, but in a unique way, how can you really, um, you know, go deeper than perhaps something that, you know, 5,000 people might already be working on? Um, One of the things to do that is really map considerations for your future state. We talk about, you know, thinking into the future a lot. But the truth is, is that you can't just think into the future and think, well, what do I need to do now? You have to kind of look into the future. And again, not too far into the future because things can change. But go a couple years out and say, okay, if things go the way we think they will, what will it look like then? And so what can I do now to be the first in 
to create that future state now. Because at the end of the day, past and future don't actually exist. Um, the only thing that exists is the present, but, but we can use the future state to enable our present and get in quicker. Um, so, so ask yourself those questions and, and, and kind of challenge you, yourself and your team to think about it from that, in that direction. Um, and then finally, and this is probably one of the most important ones, don't wait until you're ready 100%. Um, really what you have to do is you have to move quickly and iterate over time. You mm -hmm. need to get something out there because the truth is, if you wait until you're 100%, you'll probably be obsolete by the time you get anything done, right? So, so think about it from the perspective of what can I do today um, to solve for these problems and to alleviate problems that I may have in the future. Get some ideation down, uh, tap your team to ideate and, and, then, and then put it into practice and get it down and get it done and find the tools and find the direction that you want to go in and, and move quickly. Um, and then, you know what, as you get reaction, as you get feedback, as you get um, additional ideas, iterate, iterate what you're doing and, and pivot and change uh, as you go. Yeah. And, you know, this is just a taste of Brad's brilliance for everybody who's watching. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, really around you know, it's not enough to just be be dealing with the onslaught of what we're dealing with. We've got yeah. to be the leaders of all of this. We've got to yeah. take that. And that requires energy. It requires resilience. It requires stamina. It requires new thinking. And where do you get that? You have to go to places where that that is where the discussions, that's the level of discussion that's happening. And, and that's really why we created the retreat, really. Exactly. Um, that's really uh, that. That's our presentation. Is AI is not replacing humans? Here's why. And just to close off with Brad, um, just sort of leaving anybody who's watching with some practical tips. Like somebody's watching and they're, they've never used AI. Let's let's go by that assumption. What yeah. would be a starting point that we could recommend for them? Yeah, I, I would say get on Google immediately <laughs> and Google. Um, you know. AI gurus or whatever word you prefer. Yes. Um, there are so many people out there that are talking about this. Um, you know, just yesterday, uh, Justin Trudeau released a $2.4 billion fund, uh, fund, government fund to help iterate AI in Canada. And, and so I think that, you know, some people agree with that. Some people disagree with it. Um, you know, should we be spending that money there or somewhere else? The truth is, is we're, we're really about to be, um, you know, AI has gone mainstream. Um, it's been around for a long time, but it's now mainstream. Um, it will become more and more part of our lives. I think that, you know, if we want to be at the forefront of, of where it's going, um, we need we need that money. Um, we need that knowledge. We need that experience. So get online, find those educational resources, find those people that you can follow. Um, a great person uh, that you should look up, her name is Amber Mac. Uh, yes. Just Google Amber Mac. Um, Cheryl and I both know her well. Uh, one of the smartest, brightest minds in technology. Um, knows a lot about AI. Subscribe to her newsletter, follow her podcast, do everything you need to do uh, with her. And that will lead you into a whole bunch of other directions as well. Um, but make yourself knowledgeable. Um, get up to speed. Try the tools. Um, yes. and, and go with the mainstream one first, like Midjourney and, and ChatGPT, those are fairly easy and, and, and you know, easy to adopt. Um, but even if you are, have already been doing that, even if you're a leader that's fairly deep into AI, um, go even deeper, look for those, you know, the, I think in music, they call them the deep cuts. There's plenty of deep cut um, uh, people that you can follow that are going, uh, you know, even deeper into the technology, um, even deeper into how we're, you know, iterating AI. Um, yeah. Just get, and, yourself, and you know, get yourself involved. Yeah. And what I would say is if you are worried, if you, if you came to this LinkedIn live, cause you're like, I, yeah, well, is AI going to replace us as humans? I would say as humans, we, we, we should be fearing being replaced by AI. We should be fearing being replaced by somebody who's made themselves knowledgeable and apply, applying AI. That's because right. That's, yeah, that's such a good point, Cheryl. Yeah. 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 AI, that's, that's the answer to this whole thing. AI is not replacing humans. 
humans are humans that understand AI are replacing are replacing humans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there you go. That's our that's our LinkedIn live in a nutshell. Exactly. Thanks you every thank you everybody for tuning yeah. in on this one. We'll see you next week on the April fifteenth. If you have not registered, please go over and do that. We've had a lot of fun doing these. Um, and once again, if you want more information, please go to supercrucialleader.com. Have a yeah. great rest of the week. Take care. Enjoy the eclipse, everyone. Bye. Yes, exactly. Take care.